Alrighty, yesterday was not a drill, nor was it a dream, so let's dive into day three of the executive branch. And today I kind of want to focus in a little bit more on talking about the presidency of the United States. So, there's only one person as president at any given time in the United States. We're not in a situation where we have multiple leaders in the White House, it's just one guy and that's it. And so far in our nation's history, we've had 45 different presidents as in we are on president number 45, but only 44 actual people. Now, if you're wondering why that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, unless you have, like, the robotic president who wouldn't count as a person, the reason why we have 44 people but 45 presidents is because Grover Cleveland was the 22nd and the 24th president, basically two non-consecutive terms. He wins the 22nd, he loses to Harrison for the 23rd, and he beats Harrison for the 24th. Now, as far as, like, how can you hit that position, here are the former qualifications for it. You need to be at least 35 years old. So, as far as our nation has gone, the youngest has been Theodore Roosevelt at 42, JFK at 43. You must be a natural-born citizen of the United States. This is one of the only positions in government where the Constitution explicitly says, yes, you must be born here in the United States of America. That way, our presidency can't be bought off by, like, foreign interests. And you must have lived in the United States for at least 14 years of your life. And the yearly salary is set by Congress. It's about $400,000 currently, which to us is a huge, large sum of money, especially right now. Uh, but for people who are in the White House, those guys are typically millionaires, and in the case of the current president, billionaire. And that's not really a necessarily huge chunk of money. Uh, there's a reason why President Trump donates his salary each year. As far as how long the president is in office, they get one term when they're elected, and that term is four years in total. And once that four years is up, they can run for re-election and get a second term if they win, bringing it to a total of eight years, and then no more after that. And regardless of what happens this year in November, whether we stay with President 45 or move on to President number 46, each president is inaugurated the 20th of January at noon Eastern time. So January 20th, noon Eastern time, 2021, you will see an inauguration. At that inauguration, you'll see the presidential oath there. Now, in the Constitution, it specifically states what that oath is, but here it is in short summary. I do solemnly swear or affirm that I will faithfully execute the office of the President of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Notice at the end, protect and preserve and defend the Constitution. At the end of the day, no matter what branch of government you're in, the Constitution overrides it all because it ultimately made it all. Now, you might be wondering, where did that whole idea of two terms come from? That actually came from George Washington, the first president of the United States. Washington chose to serve two terms, and then he decided to voluntarily give up the position, citing that no one man should be in power for that long, citing that he was not a king, and that we don't want anything remotely similar to it now in our republic. And every president after Washington followed that example, ones that could have very well won a third term, but decided, no, Washington was right. The only one who didn't was FDR, who served for four terms, but that was because of World War II. And if you remember from our Constitution unit, we all remember the 22nd Amendment. So something like this picture here cannot happen anymore. So sorry, like Tron, Lindsey, Caleb, Nick, Wade, and any other Trump sympathizer. Um, yeah, I'll let you uh, rest on that one. Anywho... That being said, what would happen if the president dies, though? We all know the statistic. 10 out of 10 people eventually die. So, what would happen to us as a nation if the president of the United States couldn't ever or could no longer serve? Well, that starts something known as presidential succession. Should the president be unable to fulfill their duties for whatever reason, and we'll go over those reasons in a second, that starts a line of presidential succession, which is a fancy way of saying who is going to succeed and become the next president of the United States. Now, there's three ways this line can start. The first is death. We have eight total presidents who have died while they've been in office. Four from assassination, four from various causes. Some of those assassinations 
probably look very familiar, like Abraham Lincoln or JFK. Some of those may not look necessarily familiar at all. I'll choose the most interesting, William Henry Harrison. Uh, well, he died of pneumonia, and it was totally avoidable pneumonia. As in, during his inauguration, it was a very cold, wintry day, and he was supposed to give a speech. And this was like the equivalent to like freezing rain, sleet, all sorts of yuckiness you don't experience in Florida. And his advisors would tell him like, hey, you know, if you want to just stay home, we can reschedule this tomorrow. It's like there's like two people out here listening anyways. But William Henry Harrison wanted to make a point, and he was stubborn because he was a former general, saying, no, these people need to know that their president isn't scared of a little weather when it comes to giving a simple speech. And it was a great speech. It was about two hours long in freezing rain. Then a month later, he dies of pneumonia. Interesting, I know. The next way that line of succession can start, though, is impeachment. Now, as of today, we've had three presidents formally impeached. You have Andrew Johnson for not being Abraham Lincoln. You have Bill Clinton for lying under congressional oath. And you have Donald Trump for your guesses as good as mine at this point. That being said, no president has ever been convicted for said impeachment, which means they haven't been removed from office. You're wondering, or at least if you remember from our last unit, Richard Nixon resigned, so he voluntarily left the office. He wasn't kicked out. Disability is also another way that this line of succession can start. Now, for a long time, we just basically gambled when it came to our nation's health when it comes to the President of the United States. There's interesting stories of how former First Ladies had to literally forge the signature of some of their husbands just because their health was in such bad shape while they were in the White House. Now we have something known as the 25th Amendment, which lays out exactly what to do if the president is disabled or unable to exercise their duties. Which, uh, speaking of which, fun fact, if you were wondering, like if you keep up with the news, why the media was making such a big deal about President Trump not taking the coronavirus test like as soon as possible, it was because of that amendment. Testing positive would be grounds to possibly enact it, saying that the president would be unable to fulfill their duties in that state. I'll let you gauge whether or not to take that seriously or not. But moving on with disability, so basically, should the president be unable to discharge the powers and duties of his office, the vice president can take over, whether it be on a permanent basis or a temporary basis. So an example of this would be like Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan was having surgery to remove a tumor from his intestines. His vice president, George H.W. Bush, was acting president for the nearly eight hours it took to finish that up. So there's never a situation that will never be without a commander-in-chief, in other words. If Ronald Reagan didn't wake up, then George H.W. Bush would have been president. If he did, then Ronald Reagan just continues as such. Now, when it comes to like the line of how that starts and who gets what and what order, there are 18 people waiting in line to become president should the president fulfill any of those qualifications. Um, Unless there's vacancies, which sometimes there is vacancies if presidents get rid of some of their cabinet members or they're waiting for them to be confirmed, or if someone was not born in the United States. If you notice, there's some lines on that chart over there, like for instance, Elena Chow for the Secretary of Transportation. That's because she was not born in the United States, which means she's perfectly eligible to be a cabinet member, but not eligible to be president of the United States. Hence, they skip over her. Um, now, for our purposes, just know the first four and hope for the best when it comes to the presidential self. We've never gotten past vice president, so don't get your hopes up. President dies, vice president takes over. If both of those guys die simultaneously, speaker of the house takes over. If all three of those people die simultaneously, the president pro tempore of the Senate. And if all four of those people simultaneously, it starts the cabinet members. Anywho, enough about president. Let's move on to the vice president. I am vice president. In this, I am nothing, but I may be everything. John Adams, the first vice president. I think that echoes really well the job of the vice president because pretty much for the beginning of our nation, the vice president really didn't do a whole lot in the executive branch other than be ready if the president of the United States dies. They also broke ties in the Senate, but that wasn't as common as you think. Nowadays, the vice president is pretty much very active in the president's cabinet because at a moment's notice, if the president suddenly is unable to fulfill their duties, they got to pick up exactly where they left off. Harry S. Truman found that out the hard way when he became president of the United States after FDR passed away. 
But if I had to simplify it in simple terms for the vice president, it's kind of three basic points. One, be active in the president's cabinet because you never know when you might have to take over as president. Two, break the ties in the Senate. And three, do whatever the president says when it comes to like foreign visits, speaking to Congress, or even potentially sitting next to Kim Jong-un's sister at the Olympics. Whatever the president tells you to do, do it. Now, there's one more person, though, in the White House that is very, very important to it, and that's the First Lady of the United States. Now, the First Lady is the official title of the president's wife. It's not an elected position. It's not a position that we vote for, obviously, so they don't have any direct role in the president's administration. It's not like they lead, like, a department or that they uh, give, like, impressive speeches in front of Congress or sign bills or something like that. However, that doesn't mean they just sit around and do absolutely nothing. A lot of our first ladies, especially in the 20th century, have been very outspoken on political issues and social reform, basically trying to use the platform of the White House in order to promote some type of positive change. A couple examples for you guys. Jacqueline Kennedy restored the White House. Pat Nixon promoted national programs for special needs. Laura Bush supported the troops in the Middle East. Michelle Obama was very outspoken on eating right, having a great diet, as well as being very active and promoting a healthy lifestyle. Now, as far as our current first lady, that would be Melania Trump. Um, if you don't know, she was born in Slovenia, and she's worked basically as a fashion model for various agencies in Milan and Paris and all those fancy places. She became a permanent resident of the U.S. when she married Donald Trump in 2005. And she also was the first naturalized U.S. citizen to become First Lady of the United States. Naturalized means simply that they weren't born here, but they became a United States citizen through various means. And that's not all. As far as like her platform, she's used the position of First Lady for the following things. One, gender equality. Two, children. And three, bullying, especially cyberbullying. And I gotta say, she's quite uh, smart. She speaks five languages fluently. I can barely speak English regularly, so uh, I'll let you judge on that. Now, in the words of the great Bill Belichick, do your job. In other words, do the day two and day three assessment and turn it in ASAP. 